Hello and welcome to episode three of the Town Social. I think this one's going to be a bit shorter than the others as we look back on Huddersfield Town nil, Preston North End nil. But we'll still try and make the most of it anyway. My name is Greg Marley. Joining me once again is Cameron Pope and from down under Ian Kilroy. They're making their debuts, which now means there's 10 people that's been on this podcast in all the short time. He's the man behind the media at Dewsbury Rams, Stephen Downs, and Gareth Kay on his iPad is joining us too this morning slash afternoon, whenever you're listening to it. Um, Huddersfield Town nil, Preston North End nil. I'm not sure we can go into any more detail than say it was a snooze fest. I've watched it back twice and I regret that deeply. But I'm not sure where we just, we can start, but I'm looking at the face of Cameron Pope and he, he's looking at me like I'm an idiot. So, Cam, how did you see it yesterday? It was more of a painful expression, to be honest, Greg. I think I felt your pain there. It was certainly one that you needed to get the matchsticks out to keep the eyes open. It's not something I want to sit through again. So now I certainly feel your pain. It's got to be, uh, I'm going to say, add the times in that game, ruining the fact that I uh, was born into an HD3 postcode. And so I, I think there are some positives to take from it. And I've had to search deep. I, I again watched some of the game back last night in the bath, which I hadn't, uh, really wished I hadn't. But, you know, I think we can take from it the fact that the slightly concerning lack of attacking uh, zest from town was counterbalanced by the team effort from Preston. And so if we can hold a team like that who's got everything to play for, I guess that has to be a good thing. We saw the best or the better half of Christopher Schindler after a couple of games, um, a bit of a wobble. That's encouraging to see as we come into the thick end of the season. And I think also I think credit's got to be given to Trevor Chalabar, who was playing way out of his comfort zone uh, at right back. And I think the birthday boy today did a sailing job. I don't want to comment on yet what you do in the bath cam, to be quite honest. But <laughs> I could, I, I'm sorry for that imagery, gents. I, all I'm seeing right now is like a glass of Prosecco and watching town bath. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't suit. Uh, Steve, it was Timothy uh, Taylor's. It's okay. Oh, that's all right then. Makes it makes it all the better. Uh, Steve, you've seen a lot of snooze fests in your time. Um, yeah, I have. Where does that rank? Ranks higher than any that we watched in League One, but uh, not not miles above it. I have to say. I thought it was a, a decent control performance from town in, in a defensive aspect. Better than what we've seen for most of the season, to be fair. Uh, as Cam rightly points out, you know, Schindler was a lot better. I've I've got to grow and like Steam and the more games I've seen him play, I think he can be an effective um, centre-back. And, and like Cam says as well, Trevor Shalabar at, at right back, although, you know, I'd rather not see him there too often. If we've got to play him there, we've, we've got to play him there. And I think, you know, he, he wouldn't have played there ideally if Bakuna had been available. Hoggy and O'Brien in the middle did their job as well, you know, superbly. I, I'd like to see O'Brien push forward a little bit more. I think he can be um, more effective in... in attack but we looked a lot better with Campbell up front like we did against Birmingham I just wish that we'd have a bit more punch up front to be honest and even when the substitutes were made you know it didn't really make that much of a difference not Preston you know tough team but it was a chance to get a win on the board and, and get three points especially with everybody losing which I'm sure we might come on to, to speak about. I was say, two points from four games for Preston North End since the restart. Although, to be fair, there was one shot on target for town, so I'm not sure exactly what we were doing going forward anyway. But that such is life. And when you're in a relegation battle, every every point counts. And, and I'm going to the more experienced gentlemen on this call with their footballing knowledge, uh, Mr Kilroy and Mr K. You know, I, I have watched this twice and I'm trying to make light of... Uh, and I think we can all just walk away from the game saying, oh, fair enough, we've got a point. But <laughs> Mr. Positivity, Mr. Mark Devlin said that we needed to be positive. Can we take any more positives out of that, except that, you know, it's two, two clean sheets in a row? Not, not really. I think that was probably overselling the, the level of entertainment that was on offer. <clears throat> what surprised me was it was two teams that actually had something to play for. Preston are desperate to get in the playoffs and we're desperate to avoid relegation. And it, it didn't, it certainly didn't play out like that. Um, Preston looked like a team that have lost confidence and lost their way. And similar to Birmingham, I thought they played into our hands really. They, you know, they, the first few minutes, they started to push through the middle and we actually looked like we were going to struggle with their pace. But somehow we managed to funnel them down the channels for the rest of the game. And, and that's when Schindler and Steerman came to the fore. Because, you know, dealing with crosses, dealing with headers, you know, blocking shots, that's where they're good. 
falls in behind, that's where they struggle. So I think Preston played into our hand around that around that point. You know, we I'd come to the conclusion before the Birmingham game, we didn't have time to play ourselves back into form. And I don't, despite the Birmingham win, I don't think we're showing any great form. But I'll take a point. You know, I'd have taken the point long before the game, and I'll take a point after the game. Uh, as you said, two clean sheets back to back. You know, there, there's lots of positives. The game itself was not a positive, let's be fair. But, you know, we're putting ourselves in a real strong position. And as Steam says, the results, finally, we had a day where all the results went our way for the first time in a long time. So, you know, we were in a really good spot, I think, after that after that result. Yeah, job done. I think, I think it's as simple as that. I think going into that game, um, and if you look at ESR subbing for starters, the, I, I think the target was always a point. I, I don't think, I don't think the Cowleys went into that expecting anything more than a point, and and we played to safeguard it. We we played to safeguard the point. We learned against Wigan, against a team that sat really deep and asked us to to try and break them down and, and be creative, and we suffered badly. We we were awful. We just can't do it. We don't have the players available to do that. And the Cowleys are the really tactically the tactic tactical geniuses in that they saw that and they decided to rather than whinge about it, copy it. And that's what we did against Birmingham. We sat deeper. What happens there is, because we've got two slow centre-backs, you sit deeper, they can't get around the back. We never looked like conceding against Birmingham. And to be honest, yesterday, I didn't think, I didn't think we looked like conceding either. I know first 15 minutes, normally in a game, right, it's really difficult to kind of gather what's going to go on for the next 75 minutes, plus, plus added on time, right? But yesterday, even in the first 15 minutes, the first few minutes, yeah, Preston looked a little bit better than we did, but it was still a pretty calm and dire just, stalemate and, and, and that's rare that is really rare in professional football normally the first 15 minutes is frantic doesn't really play out that way but yesterday it did and for the first time in four years of watching i follow i fell asleep after 17 minutes and 17 seconds and i know that because however it happened i must have paused the keyboard or shut the laptop or whatever and i watched i think this is just going to be nil nil and i turned to my wife i said i said pop this 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 is going to be a nil-nil. This is, this is the most nil-nil a 15-minute start I think I've ever seen. Even more so than the playoff final. Um, oh, it's, there's no way there's a goal being scored in this. Anyway, I, fell asleep. I woke up later on and, and finished the game off at 4 a.m. in the morning. And I wish, I'd, I wish I'd just turned it off and gone to bed, to be honest. But the game started as it went on. There was just nothing there. And it was just clear that the Cowleys were happy for it, for it to go that way. I'm actually more surprised, not at town taking that approach to the game, but Preston, they've still got stuff to play for. They're only a couple of points outside the playoffs, but they look done. They look like they're already on holiday. We, we've, adjusted, we've adjusted the back line, first off, because Simpson's not there. He did a lot of covering that people don't give him credit for. He isn't the um, physical kind of player he was previously. He's not that. He's lost a lot there. But his knowledge and his experience basically brought us from one point in 10 games to being competitive. And probably, if we carry on this way, we're going to stay up pretty comfortably, regardless of what happens with Wigan and their points deduction. But because he's gone now, the two centre-backs against, against Wigan tried to step up and tried to push a high line, tried to press high. And to press high is the forward line. The defence has to press high too. We don't have the guys to do that anymore. And the Cowleys, on the back of one game, or two games with Forrest, if you count that one, have changed it. They've changed it entirely. And we are now, like when they first came in and we used Diakabi and Bakuna to score goals against a run of play and steal points away from home, we're playing that nearly every game now. And I expect that to continue to continue through to the end of the season because it works. It was like a game of defence versus defence. And guys, as you know, if you play attack versus defence in training, you can play it sometimes for 45 minutes, non-stop all the possessions with the attacking team. But if the defence have, have a solid enough back line and are compressed far enough with a decent goalkeeper behind them, and we've got Lossel, so he's probably the best in the division, it's very, very hard to break them down. And we're going out with that focus now where we'll sit deep you come and try and beat us because we try to beat other teams. We try to be creative by dominating possession. And at the moment, we don't have the players to do it. But playing this way, we'll be fine. We'll, we'll be absolutely fine. I think they brought ESR on after an hour. <clears throat> and then for the last 10 minutes, they brought Willock on. But with respect to Willock, he doesn't have the pace that Diakabi had to get ourselves 50, 60 out of the pitch. But we had two or three breaks. You know, in the last 20 minutes, we had two or three breaks. But that seems to be the way at the moment. The last ball into the box, that bit of quality that was needed to turn that break into a decent chance never came so as a consequence we wasted those opportunities but you know I, I think you're probably right I think they did set up for a point and to be honest I think Preston seemed happy with a point which I just find bizarre 
I think what the game also showed is that in Carl and Grant, although he's a very good striker and we know he can score goals, that was the sort of game where, you know, your top man would naturally try and and, and create something. And he hasn't that ability. He's not good at holding the ball up. And after, what, I think it was 70 minutes, we took him off. And while I like Carlin, I think, you know, there's a lot to work on in, on his game. Uh, when Emil Smith-Rowe came on, he was able to, to work himself into some positions. And as uh, uh, Gareth rightly says, you know, from that, then we created a, a few more things. I also like from Mikel is like touching what on, on what Stevens just said is that I quite like that the fact that he's okay far and away our most uh, our strongest attacking player. He proved in the Premier League that he can score goals. He's certainly fearless, just not quite the ability perhaps of an all-round Premier League player yet, but certainly on the way. But I like the fact that the Cowleys aren't. Um, we'll happily bring him off if you see him he's not working. We don't feel reliant on him. We don't feel like we have to stick with him. And so I think it shows a lot of confidence in themselves that, that they're not afraid to make the big calls with the team sheet. And I was impressed to see that really when it wasn't as effective as we might have hoped. To be fair to the Cowboys, and I and saw what, um, I'm not sure if you saw what Curtis Woodhouse tweeted out yesterday and seen some town fans that Cowboys have, I don't know, unduly got some stick, which I'm, I'm not necessarily been quite understanding of, to be honest, because if you look at the table since they took over, we'd be comfortably mid, mid, mid-table ourselves. But what they are showing, and Ian said it, and, and other people have quite rightly said it on social media, is that unlike previous managers, they have the ability to change tact. Whereas under Wagner and, and Siva, we had, well, I, less said about Jan Siva, the better, but under David Wagner, we had one plan. We had plan A and plan B was... Uh, stick a centre back up front and go four four two, which um, I'm all for four four two. I'm a big Mike Bassett fan, but um, it just doesn't work. And they are getting the best out of a lopsided squad. You know, we are overloaded in certain positions, and we we're lacking in others. We can't complain. We've taken four points from the last two games. We've taken two clean sheets. We have got a bit of momentum behind us now, and we are, you know, as the table stands, uh, for five points. Uh, off relegation if you take into to account um, Wigan's points deduction the current bottom three with that deduction all lost yesterday so you know, I think I think we're in a we're in a good position that potentially after this week when we play Reading and Luton on Friday night uh, sorry Ian you're going to have to have another 4am get up I think that is I've got two uh, this week Greg I've got the Wednesday and the uh, Saturday morning so uh, I want to be uh, a delightful mood on the, the afternoon <laughs> <laughs> but, but it, you know, again, if we take four points from them two games, we are comfortably safe. And uh, they have managed, in, in fits and starts, to turn it around. And they are learning from this squad. They haven't really had a proper transfer window to get out some of the players who are out of contract and they do not want. And they haven't been able to bring in all the players that they do want. You know, we, bar Harry Toffolo, we have not signed anyone permanently. So we're in a position where we don't quite they they don't know quite know what they're going to be looking at come whenever the start of the new season is so every single one of these positive results is only good for the future of the club they say as well if we've got a, if we're looking at um needing two extra wins to really make ourselves safe i'm looking at the table now and i'm thinking if if we're just to notch three more points now I, I was looking at the table this morning before i came on here and that puts with wigan's points deduction that would put us on 49 points right wigan now are effectively on 38 so they're going to need 11 points from their remaining if we win the next one they're going to need 11 points from their remaining five games to match us barnsley are going to need eight points and luton are going to need nine and of course they're going to be playing us too so i think even with one win we're really looking um it's really looking favourable to us and I think from a, a week ago this was looking completely different but I, it's it's such a, a strong outlook now compared to what seven days ago when we were back on this podcast off eight days ago and then it was and I, I think you know it's testament to like we say their ability to change things up that we're sitting here talking in, you know in such a, a positive mood for a change. One thing when they came oh, when in you... it's not like they came in and they inherited a squad that was underperforming they've come in and the squad's horrendous for, for a squad that's just come down from the Premier League you won't find many in the history of the Premier League that's as weak as ours is. It's awful. It's not like they could, like, for example, Warnock's come into Borough there and they've got a decent enough squad. You, you expect him to be able to turn it around pretty quick and, and for them to find survival. But when, when it, the, the Cowleys came in here and we had the third worst season in Premier League history, 
they're, they're not coming in to turn a bunch of previous winners back into winners. We had guys that have never played in the Premier League, never played in England before. And that's where most of our money was, was spent. For them to be able to find some sort of value from that squad and for us to still be alive, never mind, never mind, looking pretty much, not to say safe just yet, but it's, it's, it'd be quite a Huddersfield Town thing to do to get relegated from here um, <laughs> after, after the win uh, on the, on the uh, midweek and then and yesterday's draw. Um, and especially, I think, Luton, is it Luton and Barnsley play each other this week as well? I think they play each other this week. So if that's a draw and we can win against Reading, then that, that's probably it. We don't even have to worry about Luton on Friday. That should be it. We should be fine. One win, that's all we needed, Greg. Remember that, one win. Well, the nil nil draw yesterday left town as of where our recording, which is uh, half 12 on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, 20th place, 41 games gone, 46 points. Hull and Middlesbrough to play, they're below us. It doesn't really matter because with Wigan's point deduction, which is minus 12, they will be on 38 points on rock bottom of the league. Barnes are on 41, Luton on 40 in the relegation. So, and so with five points clear with five games left and you, you know, Ian said it before and I'll say it again, one win should be enough. One win should be enough. Um, but I think it's only natural that we move on to Wigan because, listen, we're all football fans. We never want to see a club go bust. We've all been it through it ourselves uh, as, as town fans. We've already seen uh, the crap that comes with administration. But Jesus Christ, the Wigan story, if, if you, the thread that was shared on Twitter, which uh, I think we've all read it ourselves, it, it doesn't look good. And it, it look, again, it looks like the EFL's fit and proper test isn't fit and proper within itself. And, and you know, I, do, I don't want to stay up because Wigan have been in this situation. I don't think you guys do either. It's the question of just a massive asterisk over it, isn't it? I mean, I feel like if you're taking... It's good to see that I've, I've seen very, very few people taking any pleasure whatsoever in what's going on at Wigan. And, it's, and I think it's come to light, hasn't it, that this is no, you know, sort of mishandling from... This is no real... It's just different to any administration I've seen before. I don't really know how to vocalise it because, I mean, no one could have been prepared for um, the fallout and, and, and the revelations that have come since and the allegations that have come since. I mean, it was a surprise to us all, I think, seeing that Wigan had entered into administration in the first place. But you know, if, if just half of the rumours are true, then it just makes... It, it makes it's a really worrying prognosis. One, for other teams, because uh, it could happen to anybody. But two, it makes you think, really, does, does the current protocol need to be redressed? Like, is, is this fair? Should this even be allowed to happen? It's just madness, isn't it? I mean, what I don't understand is the EFL keep going on about how they've got to have a proper owners and uh, directors test. Uh, but we all know that they're, just, they're never going to get it right. Because this situation is going to happen again and again. And look at how many clubs it's happened to. Forest, Leeds, multiple times. The Wigan situation. I mean, how can the, the league give power for a company that's just being created to take over a football club to then six months later go out of business? I was going to say there's two things for me. One is... <laughs> Um, a word of warning, really, because that could have been us. You know, when although Phil God loving comes in for a lot of stick, and some of that has been deserved in the last few months, that could have been us. You know, people talking about Far Eastern consortia interested and American consort. That could have easily been town, and that could easily be pretty much every championship level club where the fans have an aspiration of getting to the Premier League. So. You know, I, I think the EFL tests are a joke. That's plain to see for everybody. There's no protection for clubs or fans. Wigan was running at a loss before we before Wigan sold it, as does pretty much every championship club. So that ain't a great surprise. But, you know, touch wood, that doesn't happen to us. And Phil, for all his failings, at least has got the club at, you know, the club at the centre of what he's trying to do. And the second thing is, we're all writing their obituary as a championship club, but I don't know if it's over for him. You know, they're on 38 points. We're talking about 50 points being enough. Their last five games, QPR, Barnsley, Hull, Charlton, Fulham, I can see them getting the 12 points they need. You know, I think we shouldn't write them off as a championship club next season yet. I can genuinely, having seen them play us and then, and then play Stoke on, on TV, I, I can see them pulling a rabbit out of a hat. But, you know, you, you're right, the, you're right so the EFL's, Lack of control and their willingness to allow this to happen is 
shameful in the extreme. You know, as a football, one football fan to another, it's a Wigan fan, I just feel for you. Mm-hmm. I'm glad, we're, like I said, I'm glad we're not owned by, um, a, you know, I, I'd be all for, I, in the Premier League, I was all for selling to a consortium, but, you know, maybe local owners are the best way to go. Football makes no sense, though, right? The Championship has a, a financial fair play of losing five million a year, I think it was at last uh, recently. I, I know it's changed because of coronavirus, but we're dealing with um, a structure that encourages, never mind allows, encourages chairman to overspend on a club, and it, it, it's not a normal business. There's no, there's no, it's not a profit-driven business. It's not a charity. What is it? it it's, it's ego. It's the ego of the owners of the club. And um, when ego comes into it, sense, sense leaves, leaves, the, uh, leaves the equation and you're left with, with what we see time and time again. People coming in for a bit of pride, a bit of uh, self-promotion, promising things that they probably don't really believe in or, or believe they can deliver. They overspend and then because there's another idiot somewhere somewhere around the place that will come in and take over. They can spend what they want, make a mistake and move on. And how rare is it that a club goes bust? It's all right saying Bury, they're now a Phoenix club. They're in the hands of the fans again as AFC Bury. I think that's their prominent um, Phoenix club at the moment. I'm, I'm not entirely sure if they've got any others going on. But um, very rarely does a club actually go bust. They don't often pay for the mis- misdeeds of, of, of previous owners. Very, very few. Bury... And was it made? Was it before Bury? Was it back at? Um, I think Maidstone United. Was it Maidstone United? I think it's Maidstone United back in like early nineties, the last league club to go. Um, so even when these people make massive mistakes and overspend, and all these horrendous people come in and do the do the business, nothing happens. Other people turn up and look after them. So it, what coronavirus has done, though. <clears throat> Is take, it has made clubs take a hit in the area they can least afford, which is cash flow. So whilst these clubs are terribly loss-making, what they are during seasons are cash generators. So you do see cash through the tills, you do see sponsorship money, you do see TV money, even at our level, at championship level, in pound notes terms, you know that's a substantial level of turnover. So banks and funders are happy to support that and take a chunk of interest for supporting that, by the way, because there's a constant generation of cash. What COVID has done is it's killed the cash cash flow dead. You know, an old thing my old boss used to say to me was, you know, if you've got, uh, you know, if your business is struggling and you're not making any profit, it's like a cancer, it kills you slowly. If you've got a cash flow crisis, it's like a heart attack, it kills your business dead. And, and that's where football is. So, you know, I, I genuinely think that unless the, the Football League and the Premier League do something around solidarity payments next year, next season, There'll be some clubs don't even kick off next season. And I think there may be some clubs in, in League One, League Two that don't see the season out. I think Berry might be the tip of the iceberg, certainly at that level. I, I wonder though, just I wonder now looking at it um, in retrospect, um, now that we've seen or it's been revealed that allegedly a, a payment of I think it was £6 million pounds that should have been coming in to cover uh, expenses until I think the end of July hasn't come in from Hong Kong for Wigan. And I think so if that's to the tune of £6 million pound, and they've got absolutely no income coming in um, from, from gate receipts, anything like that, uh, I think you probably could argue that you know, whilst they wouldn't have been in a great position, they were always going to be in a precarious situation um, no matter what. And, you know, there's a lot that the, the Football League has to answer for for that. Without the coronavirus pandemic, this wouldn't have happened to Wigan. And so, you know, maybe just to play devil's advocate, could we even be saying that they, sh- they shouldn't even be given this 12-point penalty? Is it fair to punish them uh, by the standards set out in what was a different sporting world? You know, can we use the punishments of last year and the year before uh, in this season? I, I don't personally think it's fair that that can even be applied in this situation. Well, you look at, you, you look at the, um, the outcome of, of what might happen if Wigan go down. And the outcome is that this whatever bet comes off. So really, all, all the all the points he's doing is punishing the uh, the loyal Wigan supporters because it's not punishing the owners because it's what they want. But if that if it's what keeps Town up, I'm all for it. Give them 15 points. Give them a 20 point deduction. <laughs> I'm not bothered how many points they're going to get deducted. Because Stephen, ah. the thing is, if they stay up, he's still the owner and he still gets a more valuable business to sell. So I know I, I, you know, I, I tell you what's interesting. I was thinking about this yesterday. Was that in the old days? So let's. I'm trying to get the Jack Walker at Blackburn. You know, when the Walker family sold the club, they they left their you know they wrote their debts off. 
you know, what seems to be the modern now is that all money put into football clubs by local owners, Dave Whelan, you know, God love him, Dean Oil, you know, suddenly those have turned into loans on the balance sheet. They're not gifts anymore. So part of the problem you've got with Wigan is, is a chunk of their debt actually is owed to the bloke who's an absolute hero. Same with Huddersfield. You know, the reason we're struggling for cash is because Dean, and I'm not knocking the bloke, he put the money in, so he's entitled to have it back. It's his money. And this is, mm. this is, I don't want you to take this as a criticism of Dean and his decision, because it's not. But the practical reality of that is that we've got to pay that money back. And that's where the, that's where the chunk of the parachute payments are going. So that, you know, there's a real shift in how football clubs are being run as businesses by what we'll call them owners. But in reality, they're funders, aren't they? Is what they are. They're just a, another... It's just a replacement for a bank loan, is what these people are nowadays. I've always thought this, because if you think about Ken Davey, all, all, all the crap he got, but he did the exact same thing. You know, All he, all he did with moving the shares was really to secure it, the, the repayment of the money that he put into the club, and he, you know, he was castigated for it. In reality, he's doing the exact same thing that Dean Oyle did and, and that uh, Dave Whelan did. And, and perhaps, you know, he, he's the chairman before he you need to look at and say, well, why have you overspent? And that's where financial fair play comes in and, and the punishments need to be more severe. They're not severe enough. You know, there needs to be, and I think we might see that with COVID. We might see salary caps come in. We might see, you know, for me, I think that the whole kind of TV money structure needs to be completely ripped up and started again. I don't see why the Premier League you know, we we benefited from that, getting £100 million a year at Premier League. But £100 million a year compared to, I think Rick Parry said himself, £4 million a year for the, for the Championship. How is any team that gets promoted to the Premier League supposed to actually compete? We need to go back to how it used to be before the Premier League, where it was 50% of the TV money to the top division, 25 to the second, and 12 and a half to the third and fourth, because then that creates a better, more competitive league and it also means if you are a big club, you can actually compete at the top because you get the crowds in. But you won't, you you'll never get a salary cap in football because player power is too much. Well, we've just seen it. We've just seen the same example happening in rugby league, where the players, the the league were going to impose an even harsher salary cap, and the players uh, voted it down, and and they won the day. They they said that they they weren't happy with it, so the the league had to back down and and keep the same cal- uh, salary cap in, in place. You you'll just never get it in football. You you just but they won't. won't get paid. They won't get paid if clubs go bust. They don't get that. It, it's well, why clubs. They don't get that, Greg. We get that, but they don't get that. No, the but thing is, is, no, the thing you is, know. you can say you can, you can, The reason why you can't have a salary cap in football is very simple, and it's because you can go to Europe. So if you bring the salary cap in, what's going to happen is the Premier League quality is going to lessen, and when that lessens, the money filtering down through the leagues lessen. So you're actually harming the football league system if you bring a salary cap in. Financial fair play does one thing. It protects the Premier League clubs from championship clubs. Now we're talking about being self-sufficient. Never mind financial fair play. The word from Devo, Mark Devlin and um, Hodgkinson is we're going to be self-sufficient. So does that mean we're going to actually have a budget now miles less than what even Dean Earl put in? Whereas initially when, when Hodgkinson came and I think it was said he'd be able to invest to the same amount that Dean Oyle did. But now, all of a sudden, it's self-sustainable. That is a different argument altogether, but that just brings it close to home how important it is for chairman, for smaller clubs like, like us, like other teams, like Wigan, to overspend to be able to compete at the top of the league. There's one reason why the English Premier League is worth so much. The big clubs bring in the best players because of the TV deal, sharing the cash between all 20 clubs in the Premier League. Parachute payments are required to keep those clubs, when relegated, safe from going bust. A salary cap in any division would harm the quality and we all want the best football players in the world, don't we? That's what we all want to see every weekend. And doing anything to restrict free trade in, 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 it harms that. That's why there's no financial fair play in the Premier League. It's only in the Championship, not in the Premier League. Why is that? Uh, FF, FFP's got more holes in it than one of my old string vests. I mean, it, uh, you, know, you only need to look at the shenanigans that have been going on at Wednesday, you know, a, a zombie company taxi firm sponsoring Wednesday to the tune of two million quid or whatever. I don't know if that was a number, but I know it's a ridiculous amount of money. FSP don't exist, you know, I want you, Greg, in an ideal world, salary caps would exist. But when you're when you've got an when you've got an organization, you can't see 
what the, you know what's right in front of their face with this Wigan takeover. How could you trust them to manage a salary cap? Yeah, it's just isn't going to happen. And I'm with you. Ian, the problem you've got is the top clubs are pushing for a bigger share of the TV money as it is. Actually, all we're going to do is create a league of six teams or eight teams at the very, very top of the UK game, and everything else is neither in or there if we're not careful. But, but I don't know the answer is, and we've got to find an answer. What I would say, though, where I slightly disagree with you, Gareth, is that we've already got this. We've we've already had this six to eight um, team at the top. You know, it's always been the top six in the Premier League, hasn't it? You know, the closest anybody's got is Southampton a couple of times or a Leicester or, a, you know, an Everton. But where it would really hurt is clubs in our division. You know, you, you such as your Atlas and your Prestons and uh, your Barnsleys. You know, we wouldn't be able to do what we did when we went up, you know, and create that dream. That would just be... Totally null and void, and it would never happen again. To be honest, it's, the Premier League don't want it to happen again. Yeah, yeah. They, no. don't, they, don't, they don't really want Huddersfield Town in the Premier League. They don't really want Preston North End. They want Leeds in the Premier League. That's that that was a want. sad thing, wasn't it? That, yeah. that was, that was, being up there, it was the most frustrating thing. You think you've got a beautiful story, and you think it's, you know, I, I think what Leicester did was incredible, and every football fan in the country enjoyed it. There was something for everyone there. It was beautiful because. I grew up, you know, my dad being an Everton fan in the 80s was like, oh, you know, it was exciting. Any team could come and win the league. That doesn't happen anymore. And then, and then just for one season, it did. But whilst it was amazing, it kind of ruined it for everyone else further down because I felt that, I thought that everyone would be rooting for us when we went up. I thought everyone's going to love this, you know, small town team. Um, it, it was going for it and, and fighting. And really, I, all I, I thought we were met with was just hostility and a bit of contempt, really. And, and, and so I think you're right, lads. I think really that we don't feel welcome when we go up there and it's difficult because it's you still want to aim for it you i think as a fan you want your team to play at the highest level available but it, it makes you resent it ever so slightly but then again yeah exactly you know this 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 elite club at the top of the premier league is going to ostracize the lower leagues and we've got something even more special in this in this country even more special than how good the premier league is we've got four professional leagues you know and in some cases a fifth in in the national league that's not going to be sustained is it if there's just no chance of progression if there's no sort of you know class mobility in the football world and so what i don't want to see is you know in five ten years time league one league two more clubs dropping like flies having to go down to you know a, a, a truncated league system and, and, and losing some of this pedigree we've got because what league in in europe what, what league system in europe has this france has got you know um two national leagues and it goes to amateur uh, italy has got Serie a Serie b and then you start having a bit of a mix you've got youth teams padding it out spain they've got two national leagues and it goes to uh regional it, it we, we this is special and we don't want that but yet i think as soon as this, if this if this money drain continues and um if the rights do change the favor of the big clubs even more then that's what we risk losing and that's the, uh, that's the biggest price to pay i think football needs to look at itself and, and you know, we say this as a town fan, you know, you look at the, some of the wage, wage you're getting paid in championship, is it ready in 220%, 220% of the turnover? It's bonkers. Someone's got to change. And, and that, it's allowed to pay player wages. But I, I do think the Premier League are going to have to, if they really want English football to survive, as you said, Cam, in this kind of, uh, the tradition of it, which is what, make, what, what makes it so special, it's what sells the story to, to different countries in the world. They're going to have to, you know, let the EFL have a bit more money. It's the only way that it can properly survive. And I think too many people don't get that. And I think, you know, you see the chairman of Liverpool, you know, they're dickheads in, in my mind for trying to furlough staff when they're demanding more of the TV money because they were saying, well, Liverpool versus Aston Villa is only attractive because of Liverpool. You know, Aston Villa, you know, have won a European Cup. You know, these people don't get that. But how far off do you think we? I mean, did, how far off we have having the B teams in the in the professional league? I mean, is that you know they wouldn't say outright, but you know, is that a tactic that the Premier League teams, the big Premier League teams, ten of them are thinking, Oof, if we lose ten teams out of League One, bang on, we can drop some B teams into there and yeah. start to start. You know, they already control the academies, don't they? And I know Ian's got a very solid view on on our academy status. Um, well, I don't agree with it, but I understand why we did it. How can we compete with Manchester City and Manchester United and Burnley? Academies? We can. And, and that's their next stage. They've got teams and teams full of players who are nowhere near their first team. And at the moment, they're coming to clubs like us, aren't they? 
would be better just to play them themselves. Do, does, do you think that's a, a reality, Greg? Yeah. And, and well, listen, I don't think football fans in this country will accept it, though. That's the thing. The, 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 the anger of, of B teams being included in uh, the, the paint pot trophy. People go and watch those games. They'll be balls. No, nobody, you know, if you're a supporter of Man City, and I want to make my best mates a City fan, he ain't got, he don't, he don't give a shit about uh, their academy winning the FA Youth Cup. All he cares about is the first team. So the only reason to have B teams is for money and player development. And, you know, we, we're a team that suffers. I can understand why we... I, part of me understands the reasoning by behind closing the academy. However, the other part of me really angers me because when you see Lewis O'Brien coming through, you say, well, you know what? There's still a place for academies at every single football club, you know, just because the FA have, have, have let... Um, you know, Man City, Man United, uh, Arsenal, Chelsea, all these tier one uh, academies hoover up all the talent across the country. And it's really only places where there aren't any competition for academy places that they, that players can actually get that development like in Southampton because they've only got like Portsmouth as arrivals. Um, don't get into the dodgy dealings of what I've heard of, you know, parents being offered 10, 20 grand kickbacks for the kid to go join um, big clubs at 13, 14. It's a mess. And you hope that with coronavirus, that there will be some kind of reset, you know, with, with ownership, with TV money, with the academies, to make sure that all clubs can survive, or at least more clubs can survive. But I just, I think we're going to get to a position where it's going to be full of the money. And unfortunately, I think we're just about on the cusp because we're, in this, we're a championship club, we'll be all right. But I, I, if we were in League One, I'd be scared. I really would. The problem is next year, is League One even going to start? This is why it's so important for Town to stay up this year and for all championship clubs to stay up this year. There is no... The, the, the League One clubs, they survive, not on television money. We might get is it four, four or five million this year for television money, but once you're up down to League One, it's next to nothing. They need people in the stadium buying the hot dogs, buying the footlongs and... And, and, and buying all the merchandise to, to, to enable them to actually be a, be a football club. There's no guarantee just yet that that league's even going to start next season, that division's going to start next season. So we might, if it, it's not only important to stay up so we've got championship status and championship income, it's so we've actually got football to watch because uh, th- there's no guarantee that that's going to be the case if we go down. I don't think people understand that. I think pe- a lot of people are missing that as well. Um, but it's so important for us over these next next five games to find that one win that we need still, even though we've won one already, to find the other one just to guarantee safety, just to, just to make it easy, Greg, so you can get your Matty Daly on last couple of games for a bit of experience. We can have the luxury of a, a relaxing last few games so we don't have to panic, even though we all know what's going to happen. It's going to be 94th minute. There'll be a corner or something. We've got to defend it to stop getting to avoid relegation because that's the Huddersfield Town way I know. And that's what I feel, town way we all know it's going to come down to the last second again. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Gareth, thank you for coming on. Uh, enjoyable debut. Same, same for Mr Downs. Cam, thank you very much, Ian, from Down Under. It's been a pleasure. We shall be back very shortly with riveting debate, hopefully more about the town games rather than uh, football itself. But, you know, what can, what can you do with a nil-nil draw? Until next time, thank you very much. Mm-hmm.